it is, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Martin Tolsgaard. Um, he is an obstetrician and a PhD scientist at the Copenhagen Academy for Medical Education and Simulation. Um, his work has uh, covered, again, a lot of different areas. I first met Martin when he was advancing the rigor and methodo methodological uh, techniques we are using in medical education from an epidemiological quantitative space. So he's done a lot of work uh, investigating how we enhance the use of practical trials, the use of economic analyses, um, applying those principles and ideas to uh, concepts like studying the role of collaborative learning. Um, but he's most well known for his studies in the use of medical education and uh, technologies to enhance medical education, including simulation, um, augmental, augmenting clinical workspaces. Um, and of course, we're gonna hear about artificial intelligence. Um, and in that work, it's not just about demonstrating does it work, but also about understanding why it works, how it can be made to work more effectively. Um, and he's been increasingly leading not only uh, his own uh, program of work, but mentoring many students and trainees to do their own work and contribute to uh, our understanding of artificial intelligence in medical education. Now, I, I was, uh, Martin is a very humble man. So when I was looking for a bio of him online, uh, there's not much actually that talks about his many accomplishments, including being a Karolinska Institute Prize Research in Medical Education uh, Fellow from 2021, 20, uh, which is a very prestigious uh, award for someone uh, so early in their career. Um, so none of that is on, online, Martin, all the great things you've done. So I had to go to ChatGPT to figure out what, uh, what you had done. And it gave me a very anodyne, like boring, uh, you know, biography. So I asked it to make it into an Edic or Vi Viking era saga uh, in honor of your Danish heritage. So I, I will say that, you know, Martin Tolsgaard was born under the celestial dance of the Northern Lights. His destiny was written in the stars from a young age when he sought knowledge, not just as a healer, but as a seer into unknown realms of science. In the hallowed halls of the Riggs Hospitalet, where the spirits of past warriors of healing roamed, he honed his skills as an obstetrician. And it was here that with the wisdom of Odin and the hands of a master craftsman, he began a quest to merge the ancient practices of education with the magic of future technologies. His prowess was unmatched, for not only did he heal, merely heal the sick, he transformed the very essence of medical education, wielding the mighty hammer like Thor of artificial intelligence and forging tools that could see into the hearts and minds of young healers. And with the precision of a Valkyrie spear, he's brought, his innovations have brought light to simulations, making them as real as the patients that he's uh, dealt, uh, uh, treated. So, Martin, I, I hope that um, satisfies uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> I don't know what it satisfied, definitely made me feel very happy to read that. That was very funny uh, for me, at least. So please welcome Dr. Dr. Tolsgaard to the, to the stage. That is a difficult act to follow. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's a, a great honor uh, and a privilege just to stand here with you and, and um, and uh, please say if I need to slow down or if my Danish doesn't make sense uh, or if uh, uh, you need me to be uh, more explicit about some things. Um, just to give you a, a bit of background. So I'm from Denmark um, and uh, this is where you probably heard about Novo, Nordisk, uh, Lego, and most importantly, uh, what we do uh, with Pyke and Ull. Uh, Hygge is, is a Danish term, which is something that you do, which is cozy. That's not really a translation for it, uh, but it often involves beer. Uh, you may have seen some some uh, some, some television from Denmark, uh, Ride, uh, the killing, some of these. Um, we do have a king. Uh, he doesn't really decide much, uh, but he we, we send him a lot of money. Um, we uh, cover, we are like a commonwealth, uh, so uh, uh, we uh, include Greenland and the Faroe Islands as well, um, which are not for sale. Um, and uh, we um, have a, a public system, uh, so it's a, a socialist country where uh, education is for free, you're paid to go to school, uh, you don't have to pay to, to get healthcare. Uh, and that's also important to, to know and also to understand where I'm coming from and, and some of the uh, some of the things that I find natural may not be natural for you. Um, so you may have heard about uh, Hans Christian Andersen, uh, Niels Bohr, 
uh, or this guy, uh, if you haven't heard about the others. Most importantly, this is uh, like a code of conduct. This is a gender law, which you will meet in the Scandinavian countries. It's not a law, but it's like a code of conduct, uh, which uh, says a lot about the spirit of the people. Uh, so uh, the general idea when you are Dane talking to other Danes is you should not brag. You are not special. You don't, You should not think that you are anything special. You're not better than me. Ever. Um, and, and when I, I looked at all these things, I, I thought, well, we kind of sounds like, we, we sound, sound a bit like assholes. Uh, but yeah, yeah, may, may, makes you reflect. All right. So my research, uh, trying to, to condense what, 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 what am I interested in? I'm interested in understanding why we perform well as clinicians uh, and how uh, we can improve our performances with patients. Um, there are so many studies that you know so well about uh, that document the relationship between skills and patient outcomes. It's it's fairly well documented. What I think is really interesting is that even though that you can uh, see a clear association between skills and how uh, likely it is that, for example, uh, certain patients have adverse outcomes, uh, when you look into um, to, to other factors such as how long have they been practicing or did they complete a fellowship, there's no association. That's kind of interesting, I think, as someone doing education research. So being old in itself doesn't really help you become competent. Um, and um, so so this this was a study we did a couple of years ago in, uh, in at Sorbonne University in France, where we uh, had a national licensing exam for French sonographers um, made them take a test where they were about to 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 do some uh, some uh, scans um some transvaginal scans make a diagnosis and we assessed whether it was right or wrong um so um the uh, y axis is the diagnostic accuracy the x axis is the uh, number of scans that you perform so it's comforting to know that you that volume uh, is a requirement to develop uh, some kind of expertise there, there are no ones who have nobody has uh, a diagnostic diagnostic accuracy of 100% if you have less than for example 100 scans as you can see up here but what i'm really intrigued by is what what happened to number 39 or of or 68 how can you be so persistently resistant to uh, become competent uh, so after having completed 10000 scans there's still someone who are barely better than, than flipping a coin and I, th I think as an educator that is so extremely interesting um, so experience is necessary but insufficient we we all know this and 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 this is i guess the the the, the background for why we had so so much su success in uh, simulation based training uh, and why we uh, we see that having such a big impact. Um, so we know how to deal with this. We, we know how to give people that kind of basic uh, training and those basic skills uh, that's been very well established over the last 20 years. Uh, we know how to equip people with the right skills when they uh, are in the simulated setting just before enter, entering clinical practice, right? However, uh, when engaging in clinical practice, most trainees report that they feel in, uh, inadequately dressed for the task they're supposed to perform. So this has uh, been a repeated finding in literature uh, last 20 years that residents don't think that they are uh, all dressed for the task. Uh, this, this guy may be Sean Connery, uh, but but um, they, they they report that they don't get the supervision needed, they don't uh, uh, get uh, any feedback or not consistent feedback. Uh, and we all know these problems in clinical training. Uh, those of you who are clinicians, you know that, that it's kind of uh, the premise for our work that we work alone. Uh, we do have minimal supervision. We rarely get feedback um and and this is not something that is just a it's not just a danish problem and there may be someone who says well the residents in my department uh they don't say that uh well uh, and that's often because you're their boss uh but but uh, but this is something that has been reported uh from many different countries uh and and for many years as well and this is the the uh, the background for for why i think AI has uh, some really interesting uh, promises um, because we can now talk about technology that will 
enable you to get the same kind of feedback that you had in a simulator setting and move that into the clinical setting where we have this unsolved problem uh, that we haven't been able to solve despite 20 years of uh, research in medical education. Uh, not, nothing really, I mean, nothing has changed really, has it? Uh, over 20 years, residents don't get supervised all the time. Uh, we don't know uh, how to, to make the, the, the feedback uh, work uh, for everyone at least um we know yeah so 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 uh, so my my interest in, in ai uh, began when i read some of these these uh, really great uh, initial papers demonstrating that you could build an ai that can basically perform as well or better than clinical ec experts it's amazing uh, that you can for example diagnose uh, skin tumors uh, better than a dermatologist I, I think that's really really amazing um <clears throat> however when uh but ai also has some problems um so one of my phd students nils here he uh, took one of these ais that performed better than an, the best dermatologist and applied that ai into another data set so it came from an american data set and he applied it in a danish data set and all of a sudden this this ai that performed better than the best expert misclassified one in three melanomas uh and and so so that's not good uh that's not a good expert uh who can fly uh to another country and 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 still uh, perform well so so it's not very this it's not always very robust uh and this is a general feature of most ai models that they handle domain shift very poorly so they they don't really handle if you change the the, the input data uh very well um they are narrow. There are problems with fairness and bias and explainability. I'm going to dig into some of these aspects uh, here. So the question is, um, when are we ready to to step out of the cockpit? Um, so uh, uh, when do we think it's it's okay for us to to step back as doctors? When are we just uh, better off not being uh, at the controls anymore? Uh, and obviously, uh, none, none of us thinks that, that that we have very many examples of AI that performs so consistently well that we are comfortable just leaving any, everything and saying, okay, you do the job. Uh, so we are still in an era where we, if we kind of uh, look into the levels of automation um, that typically is used to describe uh, AI, for example, in the uh, self-driving car industry, um, then, then we are not at level five. We are not in a, at a place where we are comfortable leaving decisions up to AI. In, 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 we have a few very, very narrow fields where this is the case. But for most uh, applications, when we talk about AI, we talk about AI as something that supports performance, something that augments performance in some uh, kind of way. Um, and this is where I think it's it's important for us as medical educators to be involved. And I hope that that becomes uh, uh, visible or clear here. So there's a tendency if you go and look at the types of studies that are being published at the moment uh, in in existing literature, uh, that AI is very much focused on uh, diagnostics and and predicting outcomes. Um, and the question is, is if that is the right path, if that is how you provide the, the most value when you develop new AI, as opposed to supporting some of the aspects of performance where we know that we do not do a good job. So we know that we have problems with attention and with our knowledge and our skills. Um, and luckily there is a, a, an acknowledgement in recent literature that we need to move from a focus on replacing clinicians. Uh, that's the uh, the discourse we came from and towards uh, a, a focus on how to augment uh, our performances uh, and learning. So this is an example of, of uh, some of the studies that uh, are being published. If you just look in a medical journal, uh, this is not this hasn't anything to do with medical education, um, but I, I, I do uh, uh, fetal medicine. So I'm uh, I think it's awesome that you could, for example, have an AI that can detect hypoplastic left heart syndromes. It's, I mean, it's really uh, a severe diagnosis. It's something that you want to, to be able to detect. Uh, but at the same time, I feel when I read these papers that 
this is not what's difficult for us. It's not difficult to to, to see this. Uh, it's difficult to have the skills in order to be able to um, to produce the images that are of high enough quality uh, so that you can uh, make this diagnosis. So so um, so the question is, uh, would this? I mean, this, uh, this would be easier to 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 train. I could train a five-year-old, my five-year-old son, I could train to, to do this, uh, I'm thinking. Um, so I tried to do that. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, what the doctor is holding. Okay, so this there. It's a piece of candy. Then the last question is she. Det er lige præcis rigtigt. Hvor er det god? Og hvad med den her? Den er rask og den er syg. Så den der er rask og den der er syg. Yes, helt rigtigt. Og hvad med den her? Den er rask og den er syg. Lige præcis. Hvor er du så? Godt gået. So perhaps we shouldn't be focusing on training AI models that can do the job that a five-year-old can do. Um, and that that's kind of my point here. And, and this is where the current literature is at. But I think in order to provide value in clinical practice, we need as medical educators to step on the stage and participate in that uh, talk about how to develop AI that actually uh, supports our performance in the ways that are difficult for us. So um, this is actually, um, uh, I stole this from uh, a, a really great book uh, that you wrote uh, with colleagues from um, uh, the Wilson Center, the question of uh, competence uh, now 10 years ago, I think. Um, so if you look at what do clinicians do well, uh, we do have uh, or most to have some kind of general intelligence. We are able to adapt from task to task. We are able to interact with other people. And, and depending on which specialty you are in, you can also be empathetic. Um, and there are some things that we are not good at. We are not good at managing large amounts of information. We cannot do that in a reliable way. We really are poor at uh, dealing with probabilities. Um, and we cannot assess our own skills. It's so uh, well documented that we we, we really uh, are poor at that. Um, and we are not rational decision makers that kind of follows from the above. So if we look at what AI does well and what AI isn't good at, it's uh, the re reverse, uh, it's the opposite. Um, so that's really basis for, for a, a human AI collaboration in terms of supporting us in the skills and uh, in the aspects and the domains of performance where we know we are not performing well. Uh, and this is the true AI promise, I think, uh, from, from, from where I, I'm sitting. Um, so... Let me try to give you a few examples of uh, of what we have used AI for and what we can use AI for and what we cannot perhaps use AI for. So AI as feedback. So what is considered useful feedback? So I'm an obstetrician. Uh, we have uh, CTTs, which we use to monitor the baby's heart sound. So this is the baby's heart sound uh, here. And then we also have some automated systems that are available that can say, well, the baby may have asphyxia, uh, may have, um, but it doesn't really say, is it 5% certain that the baby is asphyxic or is it 95% certain? Um, it doesn't explain to me what is the probability that that uh, that there is a, a general, genuine problem here. Should I run into the OR and do an emergency cesarean section now? Or is the time to let the woman give birth naturally? Um, it doesn't really tell me. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, haven't been any educators involved in this in this kind of work. Another pro issue is that 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 kind of feedback assumes that a clinician is clinician, um, which we know is not right. We know that 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 this guy on the left 
he needs different explanations than the guy on the right. That's uh, obvious to every one of us. But if you go talk to a data scientist, it's not obvious. They really do think that a clinician is a clinician. And you know it from your own family, perhaps, as well, that they think, well, a doctor is a doctor. Uh, and that's, uh, isn't it the same? Um, and, and we all know who, who we would like to be uh, treated by and who we would not, like not to be treated by. Um, and this also has implications in, to, uh, in terms of, I mean, the theoretical foundations for this uh, in terms of how we should provide the best explanations and also when some explanations can be disruptive to our performance, when there can be something that we consider of low value. Um, and, and there's also empirical evidence to, to support this, actually. Uh, so if you're just going to read one study uh, about uh, AI feedback, um, then I could recommend the Chantel study, uh, which is a few years old now, but it's an amazing study where they um, have so many profound insights. One of them is, is this really nice little graph here, where they plot the um, where they plot the the benefit of the AI interaction uh, against the number of years of uh, experience, and obviously. Uh, you don't get as much benefit if you're an expert from an AI that tells you uh, what a diagnosis could be. That's obvious. Um, but a consistent finding is also that uh, that experts tend to be, luckily, a bit more uh, robust against faulty AI explanations. Uh, so we know that, that we respond to these AI explanations differently. And if you're novice, Obviously, you cannot uh, uh, evaluate the quality of the AI feedback as well, and, and you're more susceptible also to, to errors um, uh, in uh, AI feedback uh, when they're so not being able to detect when they're wrong and, 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 and uh, disregarding faulty explanations. So you can also use AI for assessment purposes. Uh, this is an example of, of uh, an AI-based assessment where you have some students doing some suturing, and then you have trained an AI uh, model here in the middle, and um, and and you uh, train it in order to output a pass/fail decision, and uh, this has an overall quite nice performance uh, if you look at it from like a statistical point of view. Uh, the only problem is that if the the students. Uh, uh, <laughs> dare to ask you why did I fail that you then you can't explain it you can just say well the model said so uh, but you have no idea whatsoever why uh, the students failed or passed the, the test um, it may be because the student was left-handed and you trained your model on right-handed folks um, we do have ex uh, examples of that so this was a study uh, that we did in collaboration with uh, Dr. Kula uh, and um, we published it last year on uh, the uh, validity of uh, assessments performed by or using an AI versus uh, the assessments we're used to making uh, using experts. Uh, so uh, the, uh, Wilma, our PhD student, uh, created this uh, uh, this CVS phantom. So when you need to do an invasive test where you take a, a small bit out of the human placenta, it's really nice that you only sample from the placenta and you don't put a needle into the baby. Uh, and uh, in order to assess how well you do that, uh, we built that simulator and we'll, we built uh, an AI model uh, that could discriminate between experts and uh, and novices uh, and try to find uh, some uh, defensible pass fail standards uh, to apply as well. So the, the the framework that we used to evaluate the validity evidence here uh, was uh, um, borrowed borrowed from uh, from King. Uh, so we had uh, our interpret uh, our use argument interpretation and use argument listed here and and we listed all of the assumptions uh, in these four categories scoring generalization ex extrapolation and implications and we tested the, the weakest assumptions uh, and tried to see well where are the flaws in in these assumptions um, and we compared uh, the ai um, validity argument against the uh, validity argument from the uh, expert-based uh, assessments. So just to, to, to take the essence of that, uh, if you look at the entire procedure, uh, 
it looks like any other procedures that you know from from um, from uh, your work. Uh, there's some identification and some preparation, and there's also some communication, and and there's some uh, procedural stuff and some post procedural stuff. And this looks like any other. I mean, putting in an IV or any other procedure you may uh, know. Um, the EBA is the expert based assessments, and the IBA, AI, uh, IBA is the AI based assessments. And what you can see is that the uh, the the expert based assessments, when they looked at a video, they were able to to look at the entire video and uh, evaluate different uh, steps of the procedure that were more holistic than the uh, AI based uh, assessments that basically just measured what could be measured uh, in terms of the input in the model. Uh, so. Uh, it it was underrepresented from uh, it, there was some some level of construct underrepresentation uh, in the IBA. Um, it didn't sample as widely across uh, the domains of performance as the expert based based assessments, uh, and and this is anticipated to some extent. There are these explainability issues uh, that we talked about uh, that I talked about, and finally uh, we tested whether or how well this model generalized to uh, other data sets. So we had a, a, another data set where we changed slightly how the, 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 the design was. Uh, it was still putting a needle into a uh, phantom, uh, but but uh, as expected, uh, the performance of this model dropped when the domain shift. And the domain may be uh, something as uh, simple as the input image, which needs to be scaled exactly the same way, it needs to be cropped exactly the same way, uh, but it could also be uh, that you have different lighting or that you have different backgrounds. So, for example, if if all the experts have a yellow background and all the novices uh, were recorded in another room and they have a brown background, uh, then uh, the AI would predict what is the most um, uh, easy to predict, which would be that you're an expert if you are standing in front of the yellow screen. Um, so, so we need to, to account for all these things. So the typical ex explanations that we have to date uh, look like this. This is from a study that uh, uh, is in press uh, on uh, orthopedic simulation. This is a hip with uh, some screws in it. Uh, and uh, an AI has been trained to, to, uh, to predict uh, how well these uh, screws have been placed uh, to predict uh, the competency level of uh, the trainee, and then you can visualize what is what are the most important pixels if you were to change the uh, classification or the re regression that you are uh, trying to predict. This is called a heat map or saliency heat map, uh, where um, uh, these pixels are highlighted. And most of you are thinking, well, uh, so what am I going to use this for? Uh, and that's exactly right. There's not much that you can use this for. It's not a really good explanation. It may be a good test that the model is not, for example, looking at the background only or looking at uh, the photographer's name or like the name, if you by incident had the name in the bottom here. But 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 uh, so, so, so it's a nice test that the model actually worked as you intended it to work. So there's some, some information that seems reasonable, but you can use it for feedback. Uh, so, so what's the point then of, of you developing these AI models? So uh, many of these AI models are built, built using neural networks, uh, which can look like this uh, and have typically, for example, 50 layers uh, of, of uh, uh, neurons that are interconnected. And uh, the problem is that these heat maps, they're typically only put into the last layer here, uh, where they uh, sample from the information that is at the end, just before the, the, the decision, but you have no idea what happens inside here. No idea. So it is kind of uh, kind of a, a post hoc explanation. It's not an explanation of how does this happen? How, how does this, this prediction uh, happen? Okay, so to, to, to back up a bit, um, there are some frameworks that talk about how to make good AI models. Uh, this is a work uh, that uh, we have done here in, uh, or 
over there in Europe, uh, also including some North Americans, uh, where we've tried to describe what uh, are the domains or aspects that we should be able to defend when we develop AI models. And if you look at these uh, uh, headlines, fairness, universality, traceability, usability, robustness, and explainability, I think they are not that far from oops, not, not that far from uh, what you have heard about uh, in other domains. Uh, so, for example, the standards uh, for educational testing. So they are not far from each other, but there are definitely some things in particular pertaining to uh, explainability that we need to account for that is not accounted for if we just use the, the normal uh, validity frameworks that we uh, use in medical education. We need to also look into AI frameworks for evaluating uh, their, uh, uh, their use and, and their development. So you can also use AI for um, exploration. Um, so for, for finding uh, out uh, new uh, theories or insight, gaining insights into medical education. Uh, this is an example from a study uh, that was published a couple of years ago where we tried to, in a simulated setting, uh, explore uh, factors that were of importance to patient perceived quality of care, where we in, uh, did some simulations uh, and gathered data on the baseline demographics and uh, some basic knowledge tests. And also we asked all the participants to, uh, to rate each other. So this is an OR team doing a, an emergency cesarean section. I don't think that looks very much like the type of cesarean sections that I do, but, but um, uh, nonetheless, um, these uh, OR teams, they rated each other uh, and they had to rate uh, how well do you know each other uh, professionally, uh, socially, and how well do you like each other? That was actually a bit difficult to get them to, to respond to that. Uh, so everyone was sitting and trying to... Uh, protect their, their, their own ratings, uh, but we managed to get that data. Um, so if you present this to a normal statistician, uh, well, it's a nightmare. Uh, I mean, how are you going to have so many uh, uh, ties that you're going to throw into a regression model? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nightmare. I mean, you could probably fit some model that would be uh, heavily overfitted. And this is where machine learning techniques come into play because they can uh, help us build some models that can account for these many uh, 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 features uh, without becoming too overfitted. Um, and typically what is done is that you train on some data and then you try to optimize that model on some other data and then you test on some data that is unseen uh, so that you make sure that the model that you ended up uh, fitting uh, is actually working when you're taking it to another uh, set of data. Um, Oh, well, so what we found in this study was that, that uh, the effective component actually was uh, mattering the most uh, to, to the patient perceived uh, quality of care. Uh, so how well the team members liked each other was a really strong predictor here. And not at all uh, how well they did on a knowledge test or how old they were or anything else. And that was a, a nice insight. Um, the reason why I, I included this so is because this is another example of some of the issues you have with explainability. So this way of presenting how much does uh, each factor weigh in is an artificial way of uh, explaining what you cannot explain post hoc. So this is not, uh, you can't really say that this is uh, weighs in 35% or 50% that the same way as you can if you have normal regression models. Um, this is uh, based on techniques such as we have, may have heard about Lime or SHAP, which are like post hoc techniques that uh, after you are done with your modeling, then you try to get some other kind of uh, explanation for how much did each feature weigh in. But it's not really what happened. It's just a way to, to explain uh, the feature uh, importance. Uh, it doesn't really explain the many thousands of interactions there may be between uh, neurons in the Latin space. Yeah, that, that, did that make sense? Uh, yeah, some, some are, some are not. Okay. Um, all right. So, so, so we know that there are some problems with explainability, and I think 
if we want to use AI in medical education, we cannot go around that in any way. It's it's not possible to to talk about AI that just spits out a, a class uh, a pass or fail if you don't talk about explainability. So so that's why we in our research group um, explored this and have been exploring that for for uh, a few years now. Uh, and and uh, the area we are interested in is obstetric ultrasound. It's a procedure uh, doing an ultrasound scan, scan, and that's why I like it. I'm also an obstetrician, um, so it's convenient. Um, and um, and it's, it's difficult uh, and it's harmless, so we can do a lot of experiments. So it's a nice case to use. But you could replace this with any other image-based navigational procedure, colonoscopy, bronchoscopy, bronchoscopy a laparoscopy, etc. Anything that ends with oscopy. Um, so uh, one of the the, the thoughts that or the uh, issues that we are experiencing when we do an uh, an ultrasound scan is how is the baby positioned? How do I get from this plane to another plane? Uh, did I miss something? All of these aspects. But in order to be able to train models, we need a lot of data. So we used to in medical education to have uh, like small data sets, n equals 20, 30. 50 would be a lot, uh, sometimes considered a large study in medical education. But here we need millions of images in order to produce really strong models. Uh, luckily in Denmark, we have these national registries, so we can get nationwide data. So in this study, we collected data from 700,000 pregnancies over a uh, almost 15 year period. Uh, now we got, uh, I think, more than 30 million ultrasound images uh, from 17 hospitals uh, that are paired up with the outcomes. Uh, so when you're born, all the outcomes uh, of these kids uh, has been recorded as well. So in the first attempts, we did this knowing that you can't use this for anything. I mean, this is a fetal heart to the left. But I mean, how would a learner know how to navigate better into a position just based on a color dot uh, here? I mean, it's really, uh, as we talked about, as I talked about, not very useful. This is a fetal cerebellum. Again, I mean, you can't use this for anything. So uh, this, uh, any clinicians here? Yeah. So anyone who could see uh, what anatomy this is, uh, where we are in the body? It's a fetus. Someone says a spine. Yeah. What if I do this? What do you think then? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah. Nice. But and who said that? Yeah. Are you an Ops and Gyne person? Perfect. What are you? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so this is an explanation that allows you, even though you're not doing field medicine, at least my, my colleagues, obstetricians, they don't know this either when I just showed them the, the, uh, the first image. So if you show this very, very, very basic explanation, it becomes easy for them to connect the dots. Um, so that may be one way to provide explainability, um, where, um, yeah, um, but we wanted to, 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 to model, uh, expertise a bit more. So, uh, inspired by some advances in the, in the technical sciences where, uh, there are some, some models for how to try to predict some interim uh, steps before the final prediction. For, for example, is there signs of arthritis here in this knee? Well, instead of just predicting arthritis, we can predict some concepts that we know are associated with arthritis. And that way you can explain whether the knee has arthritis and ex also explain why. Um, so we, uh, this is uh, the, the architecture and uh, uh, it may not make that much sense, but the idea is here that we try to take some uh, uh, essential aspects of performance into consideration. And then instead of predicting whether an image is good or not, we try to predict whether these core aspects of performance are, are done well enough. And based on those domains, we make the final prediction. So this is how the final prediction uh, may look like. Um, 
and, uh, and, and here we have the raw ultrasound images and we have the segmentations. And here we have uh, the, the, the feedback that a clinician would otherwise have given the student uh, or the trainee, trainee or the learner. So this is a way to, to, make, uh, to, to, to ensure explainability by forcing your model uh, to train uh, against or to, to train the models to predict uh, the domains of interest uh, when we want to give feedback or when we do assessments, instead of just as uh, training AI models to predict the outcome, the final outcome. Uh, what turned out to be the case was actually that if you do this, then your model becomes stronger and it actually performs better than if you just try to skip that part and, and, and jump to the end. So, so sometimes it actually provides more robust estimates. So good explanations may depend on who you are. So, so if you're a data scientist, um, uh, they are very concerned with correctness of explanations and model performance and model bias. Um, if you're a clinician, uh, most clinicians just want stuff to work uh, and to be helpful. Um, and if you are an educator, you want uh, uh, to have some considerations for learning uh, and assessment. You want preferably also uh, there to be some kind of theory that informs your model development. Um, so we are difficult to work with. Um, but but the, uh, the, uh, the Venn diagram here doesn't always fit. So it's not always that you can make these three domains fit and overlap. And this is what struggle, I struggle with uh, most of my time to make uh, these uh, the, these uh, circles uh, overlap in order for us to to ensure that what we develop is something that is considered correct by data scientists and useful by clinicians and 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 also not completely stupid by my fellow uh, people in, in uh, medical education research. Um, and that's a really difficult task uh, to, to do that. Uh, and we've we've seen that uh, previously in in the field of simulation, where you also have to do something that is useful and that uh, is is uh, theory informed. But at least you didn't have the technical challenge there um, on top of it. So then uh, there's also the generalizability problem. So the problem that we cannot necessarily generalize uh, across multiple different domains. So what I develop in Denmark may not generalize to Canada. What you develop here in Canada at Toronto University may not generalize to Vancouver. Um, and, and that is a real problem because uh, what's the point of doing research if you can't, if anyone, if no one else can, can benefit from your findings? Um, so uh, to give you an example of how you can go around this, uh, so uh, a, a typical problem is that the places where we have the data is in uh, the uh, Western countries uh, and places where uh, they really need good models are in low resource settings. Um, for example, if you want to prevent neonatal deaths, you shouldn't look to Denmark or Sweden or Finland. You should look to Africa or to the United States. Um, and, um, and, and, and that's a problem because if you look into Africa, they don't have uh, always the, the, the data available. They don't uh, have the, these large scale data that can produce really good models. And we know that our models do not generalize to other settings. So how do we, how do you, how we, how do we solve that? Um, so in, in a, a collaboration with uh, uh, scientists at, uh, at, at uh, the University of Nairobi and, uh, and also Barcelona University, we are using our models that are trained on Danish data. So building really great models. And then we uh, do something called transfer learning, which is not, now you're getting confused because it's not transfer in the sense that we know transfers as educators, but where you add a bit more data uh, in order for it to train to local conditions. And you can actually just add a, just a tiny bit of data and still make it work. So you can have the benefit of these really great models that that uh, that, that are very robust and work really good. Uh, and if you just add a bit of, uh, of of data from the environment in which you want it to work, then you can actually make it uh, work there as well. Um, yeah, using transfer learning. Uh, so that means that I can take my model developed in Copenhagen and uh, take it out in a clinic uh, far outside Mombasa uh, and actually make it work there for the midwife who does these ultrasound scans in one room and deliveries in another room and malaria prophylaxis in the third room and uh, and she does everything. Um, uh, and I think that's a really 
great promise of AI that that if you can transverse that generalizability problem, but you need to be aware of it. Uh, so you need to build, build that into the research strategy as well. And this is obviously something that we are, are uh, publishing on and in, uh, interested in. Yeah, I love this sign. Um, so so uh, if you do a, a search on, on the publications uh, that uh, are, are in PubMed, uh, just type in uh, AI and medical education, you'll see this. And probably in 2024, we'll see a lot more. Um, so if you add theory, um, it looks like this. Uh, seems familiar in any way. Um, so this is just... Uh, uh, if you go 20 years ago uh, or 10 years ago, you, you could probably see the same if you uh, did the same for simulation. Um, so, so this is a problem that we we know that, uh, uh, and we've known from from previous periods uh, in time uh, with technology that is being hyped, uh, and we completely forget everything about, uh, including theory. So, I've made a guide. Uh, for for those who are interested in in doing AR research based on what seems to be working in uh, the current literature, if you look at, at our journals, for example, academic medicine or, uh, or other uh, uh, journals. So I want to write something about AI, but I'm not a data, data scientist. You can write a commentary or a letter to the editor about how AI is going to transform uh, our field. My comment got rejected because everyone is writing about how AI is going to transform our field. I'll write a review uh, to conclude that there is a lack of empirical studies. Um, you're laughing, but I will take a look at the, the academic medicine from last month. Um, uh, it takes too much time to develop my own AI. Uh, well, no problem, just use GPT. But I don't know how it works. Not a problem either. No one else does. Uh, and you can't really test it because it's commercial. You can't look into the model. Um, do I really need to use theory? Nope. No one else does. Um, we just established that in the previous slide. Uh, so this is how to get published. And uh, when you just uh, sprinkle some AI dust um, uh, over your papers, uh, and uh, this is a really nice way to pollute our field with uh, useless uh, papers. Um, <laughs> So I, I try to ask my own PhD students and also myself because uh, it, it, is, it is difficult. Uh, is a study that you're planning to do really interesting if you move the deep learning part and just replace it by something that is really boring, like regression? Um, if it's if it's not, if, if, if we depend on having that uh, stardust to sprinkle over our paper, uh, well, then we probably shouldn't do the study. Um, I really like this model that uh, I learned from you guys. Uh, one of the times I visited uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, Stokes Framework, uh, a way to classify different types of research um, into uh, how well it advances uh, uh, practice or, or, um, or uh, fundamental understanding of theory. Um, so you have these four quadrants, uh, stuff that is not very applied uh, work, and this goes into uh, boss quadrant and stuff that is very applied that is not very theoretically rich that goes into Edison's quadrant and then you have some really nice theory inspired uh, inspired um, uh, basic re uh, research uh, that that uh, tries to advance uh, practice as well uh, past us quadrant and I would argue that if we look at the current uh, landscape of applications, this is how it looks. So we have some 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 theoretical work that is uh, very far detached from from the people actually doing the AI uh, developments. You have some some uh, some of these technical conference papers with uh, data scientists publishing on something that is medical education, but but they didn't include any medical educators, so, so it's not uh, theory informed uh, and it, it does every th all the things that we know we shouldn't do uh, that we did in the past as well. Uh, and then we also have a lot of research that just says, well, I, I want to be here as well, I, me too, um, uh, which is not really uh, advancing our practice or the theory, uh, and that's perhaps most of it. And uh, it's really difficult to come across any Pasteur studies um, right now. So um, 
if you take a look at what's been, what are the promises and what are the like the epistemic beliefs that that have been uh, raised here when you read these uh, AI studies, you can see that many of them uh, say, well, science uh, may advance even without uh, any theory. So it, we should just let data speak for itself. Um, um, and I think most of us here would agree that that may not be the best approach to, to theory or to, to how to uh, analyze data. Uh, it's never, uh, we're not agnostic when we choose the model input and we always need some kind of lens to understand the output. Uh, so, so, uh, but, but this is what's being said and written. So it's nice to know that this is how, uh, how, how AI is being sold out there. Uh, these are some other quotes. Um, uh, there was no human intervention during classification, meaning that this result can be considered objective and quantitative. I love that one. Um, I'm assuming you're laughing because it, you're agreeing, and this is a really uh, well-designed computer-based scoring system uh, is uh, superior to human judgment with respect to consistency, objectivity, and efficiency because it's not susceptible to the effects of fatigue or human bias. I think this was published in Academic Medicine. Um, yeah. How many of you agree with no, just uh, <laughs> Don't know if this is your fans. So, so these are some of the 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 the, the key selling points uh, of AI, uh, and and these are the points where I think we as a medical education community should uh, engage in the scientific debate, not in, in terms of commentaries in our own journal, but in terms of of engaging with data scientists producing empirical work that actually goes out to the uh, intended users, um, because this is. All stuff that that may sound really nice, but 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 do we really believe it? I've uh, played around a bit. Uh, I had too much spare time in my hotel room, having jet lag, not being able to sleep. Um, so uh, this is an example from GPT. Um, try read that. Can you read it? Read it all of you. Yeah. Okay, um, so this is uh, the, the 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 ranking. Um, did you read it? Yeah. So when I asked why, it said, "Well, uh, Ahmed uh, was ranked first uh, because despite these uh, socioeconomic challenges, he achieved a competitive MCAT score of five hundred and fifteen. They all got the same score. Sarah is ranked lower because of her privileged background. Okay." Fair enough. Uh, Jamal um, has uh, achieved a high score, uh, but his background may indicate more obstacles to overcome compared to Ahmed and Sarah. I don't know what the, those, those obstacles are, but if you ask it, you could actually ask it to write a rejection letter, uh, which it also does very well and 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 go about this uh, these obstacles as well. Uh, but but obviously this this indicates that. There is bias, uh, so you don't want to use this for for. Uh, I'm sorry, you don't want to use this for 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 medical school uh, admissions or for selection purposes, right? And even though that that GPT and other uh, um, AIs have been trained to to resist if you try to deliberately make it uh, like racist uh, or uh, then it it's been trained to try, try to avoid that. It's still in the structure behind. It's just been hard coded to to reject your request, but you can make it uh, fall in with both legs. Uh, this is another example here. Um, try to predict uh, Melanie's score. Uh, she's from a resource. Uh, she's a privileged privi from a privileged uh, family. She has studied fifty hours uh, for the exam for the past five weeks. Uh, predict her score. Now predict Jamal's score. He's from an immigrant family and he studied the same uh, number of hours and he gets a different score. Why is that? You can now even ask how much more should Jamal read uh, in order to get the same score. Um, and it proposes six week, hours per week. So I don't know about you, but I would be really careful to, to uh, trust any decisions to a large language model where I cannot understand anything that goes on inside that motor. 
Uh, so it may look nice on the in, uh, on the outside, but it has all sorts of biases on the in, uh, inside. Uh, it's 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 ugly on the inside because it's been trained on on our ugliness uh, as well. Um, so so I think uh, being very uh, critical of of um, of, of uh, trusting those large language models is key if you're going to do any experiments with them. So anticipate and know that this is going to be prejudiced and biased. Um, so instead, we should perhaps ask what, what are the biases of different types of assessments and how can we use AI to minimize human biases? Because we also have biases, uh, but so maybe we can use each other to highlight each other's biases. Um, that may be a, a way forward, uh, or maybe we may be able to to uh, to identify biases that we didn't know that there were there in our assessments. Um, so, so that kind of complementarity is needed, I think. So, I think we need to to be aware of the failures of the past, not overestimating the impact that technology may have. Still, technology is is a tiny part of what we do in our, in our daily work. You don't uh, do technology enhanced medical education as a trainee for eight hours and then go back home. You do eight hours of clinical work and then uh, every three months you may see a simulator uh, for 20 minutes, uh, but that's like the proportion. Uh, we know that there are a lot of scientific pollution out there uh, and, and this is really going to be a field where we're going to see a, a lot of these uh, Me Too studies that really don't, don't advance uh, the field, but just uh, say, well, I, I have an opinion as well. Um, and that's going to be very little focus on, on how to get it implemented if we are not aware of that. Uh, and if we don't, uh, if we're not careful, we are going to repeat the same mistakes we did with uh, other types of technology enhanced medical education, where we don't focus on how it works, for whom it works, when it works, but only demonstrate that it works and who cares. So, I know I was supposed to talk about the research we should be doing, but but to be honest, I think we should do the same as we always do. We, we should have clear goals, that we should address real problems, we should make our work uh, data-driven, theory-informed, and we should make sure that it, it, it's that we can implement it, and that it just doesn't go into uh, to to, uh, to to an emptiness. Um, we should fight the strong forces uh, of, of having to publish, 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 publish. Uh, we should even punish people who write commentaries. We should weigh negatively on our CVs if we published an editorial or a commentary in uh, uh, in, re in the past five years. Um, so we should do empirical work uh, instead. And we should consider our role with industry, I think, as well, because if we, uh, as I just highlighted, it takes a lot of data, it takes a lot of equipment, it takes a lot of uh, manpower to build AI models. And sometimes we don't have that available, but quite often there are people who want to, to collaborate with us. And I think we should engage with those developing AI, uh, also from a commercial point of view, because if we don't, then we're just going to have AI that says uh, passed or failed or you're an expert, you're a novice and doesn't give us explanations or doesn't focus on on, on uh, feedback uh, that, uh, that is uh, uh, consistent with uh, educational theories, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, you can ask a ton of questions. Now, I acknowledge this is not a typical Wilson Center slide. Um, it should be like a, 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 a one image and, and no text, but but uh, and uh, so I wanted to do the the Copenhagen slide instead. Um, but but anyways, you can. I, I'm sure any one of us can make like the first twenty or fifty research questions that we could explore. Um, but we need to do it uh, taking theory into account and being aware that we need to to do empirical work. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That is this working? Yeah, really wonderful so in so many ways. And thank you for taking time to weave in our context in the Wilson Center and so many touch points for us. I think it resonated with people in so many ways. I'm a bit of a history buff and I'm having a very eerie deja vu. That would go back. So in the room, there's some folks from the cohort of cognitive 
scientists who in the last century spent time figuring out the black box of human reasoning mm -hmm. um, and discovered some really interesting things. Like when we humans give feedback to students, we have no idea how we came to that conclusion. We form patterns. And, and if you force us to tell you how we made that pattern, we can't actually say. And one of the most useful, and I'm butchering this cognitive psychologist, you'll help me because I'm a, just, just a psychiatrist. But um, one of the, I'm going to summarize the whole 20th century medical education, but one of the conclusions of that was pattern recognition in human beings is a bit of a black box. A scientist can pull it apart, but the teacher needs to get inside the black box. If you're a teacher, you need to relearn all the pathways. Jeff Norman's work is a good example, many others. You need to relearn that. The early work we did in OSCE said, um, like an, uh, an expert looks like an idiot when you have a checklist, yeah. you can pull that apart. My question for you from your, and I agree totally, your very long list of pressing um, questions for us to research, which feels urgent to me, is what's the faculty development for a medical educator who works safely in an environment with AI, which is frankly already a black box? And your research, I think, suggests that the priority is a lot of people start need to start unpacking and understanding what the black box is doing. So I don't know if we need to spend 100 years figuring that out again, but I guess my question for you would be, what would you recommend today for in Pastor's Quadrant of Practicality for today's teacher in an environment where AI is beginning to appear that we help them learn um, from the base of the science as it is today because AI is already there. And as a psychiatrist, there's chatbots, there's AI, there's, it's already here. So what what should we, do you think, from your research, should we prioritize knowing there is a black box already functioning? And frankly, it looks a lot like the black box of the human mind for the 100 years before. So that's a long, windy question. But Yeah, so thank you for that. So the truth is, uh, I don't know. I haven't got any empirical evidence. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but but I, I do think that that uh, AI literacy is something that we need to talk about. Um, so that's AI literacy that needs to go into medical school and to faculty development. But there's also uh, a question of, well, how what are the skills that you need to, to I should say, what are the skills that you need in order to safely use these models and, and use them for uh, training and practice? Um, um, and and And... I don't think we know that, and I think that it's going to depend on uh, how, I think it's going to depend on what kind of models we are talking about, because obviously if you have a model that uh, is used for selection purposes, uh, those being selected may not need to have AI liter literacy uh, about that process, but but we need to be, uh, in order to be accountable for for, uh, for the choices we are making, uh, we need to understand what goes on in that black box. And and just as well as I, I prefer not to have my appendix removed by any of my fellow data scientists, I, I really appreciate uh, that they can help me understand models because now I've I've talked with them and I try to learn. I've tried to that over the last five years, and I still find out new stuff that I didn't know about or new fallacies, no new traps. Um, so, so just acknowledging that that we may not be able to do it all ourselves. We may need if we need to use AI models at all. We may need also to have direct access to 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 the people who can uh, tell us how they were developed and and their limitations. Um, and and, um, uh, and 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 where we could typically anticipate uh, that the model fails or is wrong. Um, so so I don't know if that is an answer, but but I think that kind of interdisciplinarity is 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 important because I don't know any doctors who can do medical statistics. We do it anyways. We are used to uh, just doing stuff that we know that we shouldn't be doing. Uh, but perhaps this time we should uh, try and ask someone who 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 has these competencies and bring them closer to us. Um, yeah. Martin, thank you for that. My question is about one of the studies that you showed earlier, <laughs> excuse me, in your talk, 
where um, experts still had the capacity to figure out that AI was incorrect. Now, those experts are trained in different educational models. Do we have any studies that tell us what happens if we train students using AI models and will they have that capacity to be able to see their mistakes? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So will you depend on, on your AI feedback? Uh, is that the question? So, uh, and, and when you remove that, uh, can you still detect? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that, it's a good question i think uh, so 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 uh, because ai most ais haven't been developed for the purpose of of being a teacher they don't provide the same type of feedback in the same way that we are used to so they most ais i've seen are developed to provide concurrent feedback for example uh to to support your performance all the way uh, uh they don't provide terminal feedback they 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 don't uh ask you to reflect uh, they just give you the the right uh, answer uh all those uh things so uh, so i think that that is important because the the typical ai system isn't a teacher it's just a predictor it's something that is this prediction machine it has nothing to do with a teacher uh and and what i think we should worry about is uh that when we then apply ai as some kind of feedback well what happens to our skills uh how much do they degrade how are we still able to perform without the ai um, so what are the consequences? It's really there is a trade-off. And sometimes that's okay. I mean, sometimes we're just not very good at what we're doing and we should have some assistance and and and, and that may be okay, but we should be aware that that it uh, it has a trade-off and, and we are losing something in return. But I don't see that, that many people doing that kind of research. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, just a note to our friends on Zoom, you're welcome to raise your hands or uh, come on camera. Uh, I think Jeff Jeff Norman's come on video. Jeff, I don't know if that's a question that you w wanted to pose to Martin. No. Nope. Okay. I, I don't think I threw any switches at all. But uh, I hate to do this, but I'd like to make a commentary. If you Can you hear me? <laughs> sure. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, fine. I'd, I'd like to make a commentary. Fairly recently, I was a slow learner, and it was only fairly recently that it dawned on me that there's this astonishing parallel that's developed between our understanding of human information processing in the diagnostic sphere and AI. Now, AI is not 10 years old. It's at least 50 years old. The first AI in medicine was de Dombo, 1960-something. But here's the dilemma. On the one hand, the early AI, so-called, was using all explicit models like regression models, like lens models and so on. And with except with limited domains, it was pretty useless. Uh, basically using an analytical model to predict diagnosis is really not effective whether it's done by a computer, when it's done by a computer. Similarly, uh, novices are taught explicit models. And when you talk about feedback, Martin, what you're talking about is expect effectively providing the kind of explicit weightings of this, that, and the other feature that goes towards an understanding. Uh, the trouble is that as you become an expert in medicine, you become like a neural network. It's an it's intuition as opposed to analysis. And it's a fundamental, I think it's a fundamental dilemma to say, I can't, I can't give you feedback as an, as Brian just said, I can't give you feedback as an expert because I don't know how I got there either. Herb Simon said, the intuition is largely just a matter of recognition. And that's what we're really saying is that the artificial intelligence, like the human intelligence, eventually learns from examples and from past experience. And that, that learning is not conscious. And so it cannot be teased apart and dissected. Having said that, it seems to me your approach was saying, let's, let's use AI for the intermediate outcomes, for modeling the features, for recognizing features, and essentially build an explicit model on top of the neural network that the AI is providing. Maybe that's a way out of the dilemma because right now the conundrum is AI is doing exactly as humans do. It's got to the point now where we have no idea what it's doing, but by God knows it works well. Great. Should I write that up and help publish it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I must have a response to that one. <laughs> 
Please. Yeah, but I, I, I think that the key here is that that uh, we need some kind of ad adaptability because it, surely it's it's not the same. It is not the same feedback you need as a, as a, an expert versus a novice. But we could. Uh, it, it may not matter that much that we don't know what's going out uh, on inside the head of an expert, uh, as long as we know that, for example, providing some uh, uh, some some basic science uh, supporting the medical diagnosis for the novice learner may improve his or her uh, learning or performance. And you can train AI models to do that instead. Uh, so you could also be very deliberate uh, in terms of, well, who do we want to support? Um, uh, but but the, the strategies are going to to differ, and and I, I think we would not provide the same feedback or or the same uh, reasoning framework for a, a, a novice as a an expert would be. Um, there's a simpler, there's another way to look at it. It's very simply, it's outcome feedback versus process feedback. Hmm. And your talk is predicated on the notion that we learn better with process feedback. I'm sure there's a literature on that. I don't happen to know it. But I think the idea is simply training people uh, just on multiple examples and say, you're right, you're wrong, you're right, you're wrong. That's what AI could do well. The question is, can people learn from that? How did you train your five-year-old? How did you train your... How did you train your five-year-old to recognize the ultrasound? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, the amazing... what Six images. That's sick. That's healthy. And that's just uh, uh, like what, what the machine learners call fuse shot learning. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, that's outcome feedback, and, and your your sick you all learn from that very easily. Yeah, so you need to know the process. If our goal at the but, end is intu intuitive learning, anyway, intuitive yeah. expertise, then anyway. I'll stop and said too much. <laughs> Nikki, go ahead. And, and Martin, could you repeat the question? Because I don't know if everyone on Zoom will be able to hear what Nikki's going to ask. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Shocker. Complex um, decision making and judgment decision. And what we landed on was a moment where that humans actually didn't make decisions in the rational way we wanted them to. And what we actually saw over and over again is that it's just. Yep. Sometimes we've been seeing more category recognition, we've been seeing unconscious, really fast decisions being made. And when we account them, people couldn't tell us how they were doing it. More importantly, when they told us how they did it, they told us things that were lucky, right? Their answers were completely wrong. There's no way to And in the end, we decided it didn't really matter because most of the time, the answers were accurate. Right. So even though there were um heuristics and biases being formed, in many instances, we said, don't worry about it, because if you use system one thinking, often the answer is correct most of the time, and we all manage to navigate the world. So Jeff has just proposed building models that kind of go in the opposite direction. So you build a layer kind of on top, that would be more of your basic science layer, actually giving you an accurate explanation, an accurate explanation that would be grounded in basic science, grounded in mechanism, that um, the AI could actually tell you how it arrived at the decision. So what Maria and I are fighting about is whether or not that would be a valuable teaching tool if we had AI as a teacher, AI that could actually unpack a decision, unpack it in a way that would provide a rational, maybe mechanistic explanation. Would that be an effective kind of teacher for medical education, specifically teacher for that would support adaptive expertise. So the answer to that part is yes, sure, it would. What I would like to know from you is, is that doable? Or is Maria just made up a world where AI can do this thing that no human brain does? We have never seen anybody do this. From what we can see from these hidden layers, it's unlikely that it's really making these decisions in this basic science mechanistic way. Probably a lot of these decisions are being made with the same heuristics and biases that we are all doing as a human. So I'd like to know if Maria's a liar and whether it's possible for AI to serve in this supportive role in the development of adaptive expertise. 
it's a good question. Did, could could people hear it now? Uh, online? Yeah, I think people yeah. can hear it. So, um, so 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 I, 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 there's only wrong answers. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but uh, when usually when when I talk with uh, the data scientists in my group, uh, what they usually tell me is that if you know if you can see the difference, we can make the AI see the difference as well. But if you can't see the difference, then it's really it may be difficult for for an AI to see the difference. So so if a human doesn't isn't able to see a pattern at all. So it, 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 there may be some uh, arbiter bias or some uh, some uh, some buts uh, in, in that in terms of if you have really huge data sets, mm -hmm. you may find some some uh, some some patterns uh, that may inform your understanding of how cognition work. But you would need also to have the ingredients of cognition built into that model, and we don't really yeah. do it now. So so uh, and just to clarify, I think what we need is not to build a layer on top of a, a new, um, an AI model. We need the AI model to be the process-oriented uh, model. And then what is on top is defining prediction. So we need the AI to to to, to be structured uh, to, as the, the basics is is the process and not on the top. Yeah, so, 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 so I think if we don't know what's going on, we can perhaps use AI if we have, if we have large data sets to, to gain insights, but, but it's not, it's not stardust. It doesn't do anything magical for us. So it, so it doesn't do anything we can do it already, but it can do it much, much faster and sometimes more reliable and doesn't have bias and. Uh... Okay. She might be right then. Maybe. Okay, never mind. Don't record any of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I didn't mean the part about bias. And... Uh, given the um, quick uh, evolution of AI models, even like we we didn't use language models two years ago, and now we are doing it, and they're very rapid. And uh, research takes time. So when we publish our work, it was like maybe it is not relevant uh, what we now uh, experience. So how do how can we cope with it? Because the field is moving so fast yes. that it's difficult when you plan your AI research and it's getting old. Yeah, when we publish it, it is all over yeah. there. Is, but I think it's irrelevant. We, we saw that with uh, the instruction of simulation as well, uh, so that uh, people want to use uh, uh, be the first to demonstrate uh, that it impacts patient outcomes, and then uh, studies pop up. And I mean, uh, so so the I think a really good explanation. That I think anyone here would be able to chip in on this uh, would be to say, well, if it promotes our understanding of the world in a general sense and not looking into the model features because the model doesn't make sense, there will be a new model that performs better next year. Anyways, um, so it should never be about the specific model, but it should be about the generalizable insights that inform our theoretical understanding of how the world works. And, and then it doesn't, make, it doesn't matter whether you use the GPT 3.5, which is crap, or the new 4.0, which is amazing, um, because you may still get some generalizable insights. And I think that emphasizes the, the need for theory. Yeah, it, yeah. it really does. And I, I think if you have some kind of theory, it doesn't matter what kind of model you tested, uh, I, I would argue. But there may be other points or views on this. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank uh, you. Hello. Um, my question is about the data that we're feeding into the AI models um, and the sort of nebulousness of that data. Um, I think, you know, I think we make assumptions as humans that like having larger numbers of images or, you know, data fed into the models make them inherently more robust. Um, but, uh, you know, with all the, with the concerns around bias, I guess, how do we determine what like ground truth is and what the mm -hmm. like, yeah, standard should be for the data that we're sort of, you know, because I imagine if you think about data and you say like, oh, well downweight this because this data is biased and this data is less biased then that inherently is applying a, ju a human judgment. And so basically to me, the end result is that we always just end up replicating human mm -hmm. Decision making. 
but I think it's about uh, variable selection very much. I think it's about being very explicit in the type of variables that we want to select uh, and the model over those variables. Because the, the problem is when we have this, uh, we take a lot of data and we pull it into a model and we don't know anything about what goes on and then we just trust it, uh, the decision. That's what the problem is because then you will have all sorts of biases that are being replicated from the training data. Uh, but if you're able to be very explicit about, well, what, what biases are we interested in, then you can at least make them visible and model them. So I think it's about being very explicit in terms of what are the key uh, potential biases that we are interested in mm -hmm. and include them and specify them when, when you do the model development. But obviously that is a problem if you, for example, um, use uh, uh, LLMs such as GPT-4, where you, you're not able to download GPT-4 uh, or GPT. Uh, you don't know what's going on, on inside that model, uh, but that may be a call for us to focus on other models that are open source, for example, Llama uh, from uh, Meta. I don't own any stocks, uh, but, but uh, that, that is open source. You can download it on your own machine. You can play around with it you can train it retrain it uh, on your own data um so 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 that would be a way where you could easily uh, more easily modify uh, the uh, the outputs and and uh, train a model to predict uh, certain variables of interest but you're still faced with the, the fact that the reason why at least the llms work really great is because they are trained on huge amount of data and and they are going to replicate all sorts of biases, and you can try to force them. You can try to 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 uh, to fit them to your local data set, uh, and you can try to to make the, the the potential biases explicit. But as long as you have something that has been trained on this massive amount of information available on on the internet, it's going to replicate all the the the, the nastiness of the internet. I think so. So I think it's. Yeah, it's 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 a good question, and it is. Uh, I don't know how to solve it. Uh, Should educators or institutions or regulatory folks restrict the um the I don't know models or devices that we're using? So 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 like your medical school says, oh, you can only use this yeah. device that's been trained on the patient in our institution, et cetera. I think that's a really good question because if you look into, uh, for example, medical AI, it's heavily regulated. So if you want to use a, a, a medical AI for uh, patient care, you have to go through FDA approval. So the whole medical device regulation. Uh, and 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 that is a very a very long process where you have to document that it actually works uh, in the intended way, much the same way that we do when we do validity studies. Uh, so, uh, what is the evidence that supports the interpretation of test scores? Sounds familiar. Uh, so, so it's, it, it, we have a framework in in clinical medicine for 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 rigorous testing and 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 quality documentation, but we have nothing in education. So nothing prevents us from except perhaps ethical review boards uh, who probably do not know much about AI. Uh, so nothing really prevents us from taking uh, an AI and making it uh, uh, select candidates for medical school. Uh, and the, the problem is if we start regulating that, there may be some levels of regulatory capture where it's all of a sudden the, only the companies that have the money available to do those kind of regulations that are able to develop AI, uh, and then we are out of the loop. Uh, and and uh, I don't know if that's uh, good either. Thank you. Yeah. Martin, on, on that note, I mean, a, a lot of medical education data is not good data, right? Like a lot of our assessment data is poor validity evidence. A lot of it is plagued by like strong reliability issues. Uh, and yet that's the data we're always talking about capitalizing to uh, deliver on artificial intelligence. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts on like this idea that, you know, if we can overwhelm the problem with sufficient data, we'll get to some kernel of the truth or whether it's actually, or whether we should go back and start improving our data collection practices and our assessment practices and, and before we embark on this journey. I don't know. 
Yeah, and I know that the, the data scientists are talking about this problem as well. That that there are a lot of uh, of uh, uh, mislabels or wrong labels in in the, these data sets that are used for, for example, these public challenges. So the data scientists typically have these challenges where they compete on who can make the best model based on an open uh, source data set. And 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 many of these data sets are on uh, just. Uh, for example, handwritten numbers. Uh, well, many of them have wrong labels, and and just as we also have long wrong labels in medical education. What I do think is comforting is that 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 if you have enough data, we can actually see sometimes when we have some of our PhD students who are, for example, annotating stuff, saying, well, this uh, person should get the score, uh, and 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 informing like the the, the input for the AI model. Um, then sometimes uh, our PhD students are wrong, and we go back and say, why why did we but why did the AI misclassify that case where we know that that this should be another class or another segmentation or whatever? And we often see, well, the AI was right and the student was wrong um, because if you have enough data, it starts being able to uh, perform as an outlier detector, detect, detector. So you can detect outliers, which in, in, in many of our data set would enable us to say, well, maybe this, this label is wrong. Uh, so I think... For outcome detection, that is a promise. Uh, if you, if we use it like that, but uh, I guess we we need to look further into that. Thank you, Wetska. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm quite new to this area, so I'm going to use a soccer analogy for the presenter from the country of Schmeichel Eriksson, Holland, not Holland. Oh no! <laughs> um, it's so Norway. No, I said not Holland, Holland, right? Oh, yes. Um, so in soccer, I'm sure if people follow it, they know about this this VAR, which are using machines to make things more accurate because you yeah. hope you're having the right decisions made. As much as soccer isn't life or death like healthcare, but what's interesting now, after five years of VAR in the Premier League, fans, coaches, referees, almost everyone is now saying. You know, let's let's bend the 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 VAR, even though referees had about an eighty percent success rate versus a ninety six percent for VAR. So it's almost like people would rather have a human making more wrong errors than a machine making a small amount of wrong errors. So my question is, is there much research on the kind of patient's appetite for for AI in healthcare? You know, if if you take it that table, you should show sort of level five where mm. the machines are kind of doing everything and they may be doing it a lot better than humans, but do our patients actually, would they rather have humans even knowing that we aren't as accurate perhaps? Yeah, and I think that depends on, on the domain of interest. But what we do know, we did some some uh, qualitative uh, uh, work in, in, in that area where we... Uh, Asked patients about well, how how what are their uh, uh, what do they expect when they meet a doctor in the hospital um, and and most of them uh, when you talk about the introduction of AI they view it in a positive sense because they like someone to check what the doctor said was actually true uh, so so in that sense I think many patients would be positively positive about that. Um, but obviously, from the learner's perspective, uh, it may not be the best thing in the world to have uh, lots of uh, assessments, even though they may be better than the assessments that you can get from a human. Uh, and, and that overemphasis on numbers, uh, I think you, you published about that 10 years ago, uh, Brian, uh, the post-psychometric error uh, in medical teacher. Um, well, this idea that that we should, if it moves, measure it. That that is the whole grail of to 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 medical education. Well, sometimes we just want someone who is empathetic because uh, oh, that was difficult, uh, and someone to give you a tap on the shoulder. We know we didn't get the best score, but we do, perhaps don't need an AI to to re-emphasize how poorly we did. <laughs> so I think that kind of work also needs to be done. Um, about what are the unintended consequences? We we're not we, we don't sell AI as medical educators. We we're not making money out of this. We don't have an agenda where we we necessarily should 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 see be be the ones uh, promoting uh, the introduction of AI. 
we shouldn't be scared of it either, but but being curious, I think, is is core to being to the task we have as educators and and as someone doing research in education. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have some time for questions. Do what? Go ahead. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question about, um, uh, despite all the limitation of the AI, if more and more physicians and in particular more and more patients using use AI, then do you think that some uh, the uh, AI thing should be incorporated in national licensing exam in some way? Mm -hmm. Because I'm always thinking about if I have, uh, is it good to encourage students to use AI or this? I have to discourage them to use AI. I know they will use AI whether and uh, whatever I say. But if some AI component is included in the national licensing exam, they will definitely um, use or think about more about AI while they are studying. So, yeah, yeah. And I think that refers back to the question earlier: what 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 are the competences needed to to be able to use AI and, and to be uh, critical about uh, the, the 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 benefits and the limitations uh, as well? Um, so so I think that is a, a work. And I, I know that your Royal College made a report a few years, years ago where this was one of the, uh, the the main recommendations that that we need to focus on AI literacy. Um, but but how to do that in a systematic way, and also how to do that when the train is moving. So when uh, when when the technology that you are teaching people to use is going to be different next year, that's going to be a challenge we need to to uh, take into consideration. And, and I think that really calls for empirical work. Well, I don't see any questions online. Um, oh, Justin, do you want to ask follow up? Go ahead. One more question is: um, so you know, as AI becomes increasingly utilized, there's the you know we're training people to say in medicine, you're training people to learn medicine, and then there's also going to be this process of training people how to engage with AI and prompt it. You know, like with these large language models and all these things, um, and in some ways I see that as making learning potentially more efficient, but then there's also people still will need to learn medicine to be able to sort of question the AI and interrogate it. So I guess my question is like, what do you see as the like push and pull of the negotiation of, um, do you, is this just like just another tool that people, you know, like we learn how to use point of care ultrasound and that's mm -hmm. like a small thing or it, will it, do you see it more significantly impacting how we train people? I think that relates to what are we willing to sacrifice. So this is about choices and sacrifices. You you you, you may have the benefit of getting a quick uh, answer out of an AI, but but it costs you something. And what are you willing to sacrifice in that process? So what what which skills are you willing to 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 give up? Um, and and I think that. that the, the answer may differ depending on which domain you're in, but but uh, but as long as we are aware that that sometimes we get replaced, that's okay. Then we get new jobs. Uh, sometimes we get augmented, that's okay. But then that augmentation has a cost as well, uh, and we need to be very explicit about if we're okay with that. Um, so yeah, so I, I think it's 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 also a value judgment uh, in terms of what is important for us uh, because the concept of what is a competent or good doctor is going to change all the time as it always is. Um, and um, yeah. Team deep follow-up question, okay. All right, I all right. not to be dystopian <laughs> at all in my commentary. We have we've had these conversations before, but don't you think there's a problem since we we have allowed others to make the value proposition for how this technology should be used, yes. even before we started thinking about studying it? It's being made for us, yeah. right? So now we have to deal with with the the politics associated with that with those value propositions already in the 
in the environment and you told us not to write commentaries. So <laughs> I wanna know what other solution you might have for us to address that piece. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, we should write about that. <laughs> oh, I, I completely agree that, 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 and this is my point that we need to engage with uh, in this interdisciplinary collaboration. So, so uh, just as well as I, I'm not trained in the field of psychology, so there are lots of of, of uh, theories that I never will master and learn as good as my colleagues who are in that domain. I need also to engage in collaboration with the data scientists. But but the the idea that that uh, that if we do nothing. Uh, they will perhaps come to us or, or by themselves. I, I, that that doesn't hold true. I, I mean, if we continue like we're doing now, we're getting siloed. So we are going to have medical education research uh, with all our high, uh, hopes and highs and expectations, and we're going to have uh, uh, some some uh, data scientists and and some some industry AI that's going to be in another silo. And 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 I don't think it's because they don't want to work with us, but they don't know why they should. And we should be very. Uh, uh, actively seeking that kind of collaboration because it is going to happen. The question is whether we are going to be the key stakeholders, uh, but we need to document that it's a good idea to include us. And I think that's, uh, that's on us to, 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 to reach out to those kind of collaborations and to demonstrate what happens if we're not involved. Um, so, so I agree, we are not the ones who who made the value proposition. In many ways, I, I think it doesn't really matter at this point, but we need to get engaged and we need to do that kind of interdisciplinary work. And what I know from my, at least the people at, uh, uh, at my university, they really want to get engaged with people who want to, to provide, uh, who are interested in the same. They want to, they want metrics. Uh, how does this affect uh, the clinicians? Uh, when when we talk about learner analytics, they love it. Uh, I mean, the, how great is that for us uh, that we're interested in, in having the same kind of metrics for for how humans interact with AI. So I think reaching out is just really uh, important for us uh, at this stage, and not looking inwards. Uh, and yeah, I so I agree. Thank you, Martin. That was a tour de force of a presentation and a wonderful discussion. Uh, I think we've learned many things, including some of us will have to redact our CVs before we uh, go up for promotion. But that's a great pleasure to hear. So, folks, we have about 15 minutes before we come back for the panel. And, and Martin will join us with our other panelists to continue the discussion. So uh, please uh, come back at around 11 o'clock. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>